<laughs> but we have Rebecca Stoneman Washington all the way from Brandy, Utah. And she's going to be talking to us about the uses of uh, the uh, local cacti and succulents by the native indigenous people. And you have a little, uh, a little arrow. You can it. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I say four corners 
but it really encompasses the Chihuahuan, Sonoran Desert, parts of the Great Basin, um, and of course down in New Mexico. But that the area we're kind of going to focus on is the four corners. And so we'll just go forward from here. Space bar. Okay. Okay. The plants that are most highly adapted are the Cassacea and Aspergacea families. Because they have the ability to endure high temperatures heat and aridity, as well as winter cold and moisture. So they've been evolving for thousands and thousands of years to be able to survive. Okay, so the desert grocery store is about relationships and kinship, feelings of care and nurturing that people have with their environment. The earlier southwestern western inhabitants depended on their surroundings plants and pollinators and the animals that they support. By extension, the people were just as dependent on the weather and all environmental influences. So let's think about these things in the back of the mind while we're looking at the slides. How many of us today are dependent upon what we grow, gather, harvest, or hunt to feed ourselves or our families throughout the year? What plants do you have a relationship with? And how would your life be different if you were dependent on planting, gathering, and harvesting either domesticated or wild plants? Would your lifestyle be defined by seasonal cycles of weather? So, <laughs> again, it's about relationships. And this is a quote um, from an elder from the Wallapai tribe um, about comparing bison to the plants that were given to the Wallapai people um, by Elder Brother. These plants that are so primary in importance to the Wallapai people are the pinyon and juniper trees. That's considered one group. But look at the other three. Banana yucca, mescal agave, and prickly pear. So those are the plants that we are going to talk about. Tonight we'll look at these important plants of sustenance and learn how they've been used for thousands of years. Among contemporary communities and families, they still are because they're a reflection of practicality, tradition, and cultural identity. So these are some of the um, tribal nations that uh, we're going to be talking about. Going back to 6000 BC, we have what we call the archaic tradition, moving on toward about 1500 BC, we have basket maker, and that flows into ancestral Puebloan, and then the more historical tribes, Apache, Hopi, Navajo, Zuni, Tohono, and Akmel O'Odong, Havasupai, Paiute, Ute Grand, Rio Grande Pueblos, and Malapai. So the desert grocery store is all about human relationships with the desert plant path and present. So people today are carrying on the same tradition and the same practices that they were hundreds and thousands of years ago because these traditions have been passed down. They are still important. And so today we see um, Dr. Jessal Ramon um, from Pahana Autumn and she's gathering her or um, saguaro fruit, Mary Wiaki, um, which you'll see a little bit more of in the slides, um, creating her yucca twine, sandals, and feather blankets, and then Iva, who is weaving the um, sister baskets, and then the Navajo family tending to sleep care. Those are still important activities. So this just lists some of the plants, because the cactus don't uh, survive isolated, they've got relationships with all these other plants. They can't survive on their own. And um, with some quotes, our food is who we are. Traditional diets, which sustain people in harsh climates for thousands of years, offer spiritual, mental, and physical benefits. And then our friend Vincent, our Wallapai friend, um, says, over time, indigenous people planted and harvested agave collecting for preferred traits. A new species of agave developed 
different from its thus far unknown progenitors. So here we go, we're going to talk about the agaves first. And most of you know what agaves are. I was telling Scott, we could really do this whole thing right outside in the cactus garden. Because <laughs> everything that we're going to talk about is right out there. But um, you can see that there's just 40 species just in the Sonoran Desert. I don't even know. I tried to find out what we have here in, in New Mexico area, but there weren't any complete listings. But Three. how many? Three. Three. <laughs> okay, but here's the ones I really like. The, there's six to eight species with the three Colombian agave domestica. Um, and that's what the PCAD refers to. So agave is a very important food. Wendy Hodgson, I don't know if you've ever heard of her, but she has been working with agaves and researching and stocking them for decades now. And so um, she works, I think she still works for the Desert Botanical Garden. But she's the one that's really put in a lot of work um, identifying these pre-Columbian agave domesticates. So this just is one of her diagrams. Um, and it's something worth noting that um, before corn uh, was cultivated, before the whole horticultural uh, programs for corn began, people were using agave for the carbohydrates um, that they provide. So very dense carbohydrates. Back to 8,000, or it'd be like 6,000 BC um, to AD 500. Okay, you know, so this is this is just a temporal sort of look at at the people um, pit house occupation, um, going back to uh, early early one thousand with that, the Ho Ho Kong um, near Tucson. These all these people were using agave. Now we're up in Utah and New Mexico and, and Arizona during Pueblo time. Um, to can ruin T. Harris and to the food. And Chaco, and the Lear, and um, Point of the Pine. So all of these are just all the way up until present day, um, people following these traditions. And this one, called the Hohokam uh, Agave, um, this is where the idea of the chincheras and the grids were identified. Um, so the clones, the plants that were grown in these early years, what you see today are their descendants. They're, they are clones. They are identical to the plants, the pre-Columbian agave domesticates that were grown centuries ago. So um, this is the agave perii, and again, just emphasizing that agaves have had critical social, cultural, and economic impact for at least 9,000 years. How do we know this? Through the archaeological evidence. The plants themselves are archaeological evidence. And then also the tools. So this is the... I'm not even going to try the arrow, <laughs> but the agave knife. Um, my husband tried to make one of these, and he was afraid to put a sharp edge on it. <laughs> but um, it's they're very sharp, and they had to be to cut these top leaves. Yes. This is like I remember city Yes, it is. Totally. Yes. Yes, they do, especially ISIS is what I heard. Yeah, thank you very much. And if anyone wants to say it, I can ask a question. I know. You can you all know how tough the agave leaves are, so the knives had to be very sharp. So agave provided many raw materials 
a premium source of fiber. They're tough and they, they resist deterioration. And these are just some illustrations of the way that they're gave, um, how you can process it. And up on the table, there's a bag made out of agave twine and a little scrubber, but, and then most of it is, is um, yucca, because it's a little easier to work with. Okay, so this is what agave fiber strip, strip from the leaves drying on the line looks like. I, so my favorite is that an ancestral pueblo and agave fiber spot that's right in the middle. I really didn't know that agave was used to make stock. Um, I've seen them made out of cotton. Cotton. I've seen leggings and stockings, longer stockings above the knee that, that were made out of cotton, but never out of agave fiber. So I think that's really cool. I think it would. I think it might be kind of scratchy, but maybe not. Maybe it was prepared just right. Are you going to talk about the yogurt flavor? Yeah. 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 Thank you. We'll get there. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know most of you probably already know these things because you're all well traveled and well read. <laughs> but um, anyway, it's, I, I thank you for listening. Okay. So these are agave fiber sandals. They're Coco Pop um, from Mexico. And now we're moving into agave as food and beverage. So this is a historical illustration or photo on the left of, a, of an Apache woman harvesting the agave head. And then the Mescalero people on the right um, harvesting agave head. Now, <laughs> do, you, do you know what they do with the agave head? That's right. They roast them. And if you go down um, around the Lincoln National Forest and down into the San Francisco Mountains, we did survey down there and had lots of roasting trees. Um, you can identify them by the rocks and the, the clusters of rock, basically mounds of rock um, and fire cracked rock and things like that. But yes, and people are still doing it today. So these are agave heads ready for the roasting kit. And this is the roasting kit. Now, the reason that these people are roasting agave is to celebrate the, the transition of the young girls into womanhood. And they do this every year. They do it at Mescalero and over at Civic U and uh, White River. Um, I think those are the main areas where they maybe the people around this um do it also. But Mescaleros really carry on this tradition. And um, because my husband's part of Mescalero, he's mostly in the world, but he's part of Mescalero, um, we are invited often to, to these well, celebrations. Are they, are they a problem party on here? Or what, you know, what do you say? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever's ready to bloom, Okay. They go out, I mean, I can't say there's just one okay. because they go out and they look for them and they identify them early and yeah. then they mark them for their family. Yes. And so they're dug out for specific families and then the families have them identified when they go to be roasted. But then there's a lot of others, extras that are roasted for the general community and for sharing with others. REI could probably be the least that is common in that, in that area. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I was thinking, do I have an illustration photo of it? But I don't think I do. So, this is what they look like after the pits open. Now, traditionally, they do it for four days. So, you go out and gather the heads, and then <clears throat> the pits being prepared while the heads are being collected. And then they're put in there with the hot rocks and covered up, usually with a big mound of dirt. Um, and then somebody tends it for four days. So um, this is what it looks like when you open the head. And there's a roasted agave. And then these ladies are cutting it up and passing it out to everybody that's attending. And the first heads go to the family. 
and then they take them back and they have their family <laughs> private ceremony. But it's more than just that. It's a, 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 it, it reinforces and underscores collective cultural identity. It underscores ties to the land, the kinship with the agave, and how it's provided for the community um, and generations back. It's a tradition that continues, and it anchors people to who they are and to the land. And do you know what day that is? It's different. It's, it's usually in July, often around the 4th of July. And down at Mescalero, down, if you go down to um, um, no, Mescalero, right, right here in New Mexico, um, they all have like a carnival going on, and food and uh, I think maybe a rodeo and powwow. And then on the other side where you see the lodge, the TV lodges, they, <laughs> there will be um, the family, the family on slaves and they're having their, their ceremony. Is there a special day that? It's usually around July 4th. And it's around on the 4th of July. It, right. Because the government refused to let them do it for two years. I didn't know that. And they uh, said, all right, <clears throat> we're not really doing this to celebrate all these women. We're doing it to celebrate the fact that we're in these lives. I believe I, that. I've been there. That's cool. So I didn't know that that had happened. So that's why it's always the same thing. That's right. We just go down because we know it's going to be on the first. It's on the Okay, thank you very much. So that's what it, that's a good, thank you, good information. So the, it's not, and then it, it ties in with this blessing. So the Apache Town Dancers, the Mountain Spirit Dancers, um, and this is all part of the agave um, relationship that the people have with the agave plant. So here they come, they, they do their blessing, they dance, well into the night, they go to the families and bless the, the girls and the families, and it's quite just a very special event. Yes. I'm a little bit unclear about yes. what part of the agave is eaten and what it's like. And, okay. Um, can, can you use any kind of agave plant? I think they use whatever is there and okay. ready to bloom. But, but, but Rob said he thinks it's the periodic. Okay, but yeah. I'm unclear about what the final product is you need is. Okay, hold on. Okay. It looks like that. <laughs> um, so this is what it looks like. And when you get it, it's pretty hot. Um, and it's the very first time you try to try to eat it, you don't know what to expect. And so you've got this wad of fiber in your mouth. And you don't know what to do with it because you can't chew it. <laughs> And so what I found out is you have to kind of suck the juices out and swallow the juices. And then what's left is this fibrous stuff called a quid. And then you can discreetly remove it from the mouth and um, discard it or take it with you or bury it or whatever you want to do. But it, it, when, it, when you first receive it, it's like a sacrament. And... And so I was afraid. <laughs> but you do have to, it's very chewy, but it's also very sweet. So again, it's not a flavor like people are used to today. It doesn't have the same kind of taste that we're used to um, in our modern society. All right, here's the other thing. Hundreds of quids have been found at archaeological sites. So there's lots of evidence that these things have been going on for thousands of years. And these are the quiz. So if you're out at an archaeological site and you see these little chunks of fiber laying around, these are quiz. And this is indicator that people have been having in your diet. Yes. Is there much nutrition in the juice that you suck out? It's, 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 I would say there's there is. Yeah. There's the vitamins and minerals and there's sugars and carbohydrates. Yeah. Now what percentage of the quid or the whole thing together, what percent is quid, what percentage is juice? Is there a lot of juice? There's an awful lot of fibers in there. 
right? Yeah, it's not the leaks, really. But there's a lot the of leaks too. There is because because when they're baking, um, the juices are being kind of contained, okay. and because they're covered up, just like think of baking chicken or something in your oven, and it, if you cover it up with foil or something, it stays juicier. So those heads are covered up. With the grasses, they actually use grasses on top of the rock and, and keep it moist. <coughs> yes. Well, the obvious is I'm going about this for a long time. I still here. I also go all the way down to the south of Mexico. Yes, it does. Come back up here today and well, they play with it. Oh, well, that's something <laughs> yeah. We'll get to that. You guys are just jumping in. Take it to the moon. <laughs> It's a whole different story, but yeah, you're you're right about that. So the quids are oh, evidence oh, that people read. Yes, yes. Grand Canyon. There's Murphy Eye. 
you have a Pyanthus. That looks like it's very close to Sedona too. Oh, it's Sacred Mountain Wilderness. And San Pedro Winters. And I get some mighty Scots on them, don't they? And there's the Denses. And there's the Bulbils. So that's how they were transported. So you can see how people could carry these around with them. Put them in your bag, take them with you. When you're moving to a new area or to going to, to gather things, or plant some here, we can come back here on our way to go get pinions or something. Um, they didn't need the GPS. They, they knew exactly where they were going. Okay, you were talking about okay. So this is um, the beverage part. I really didn't talk much about, I didn't talk at all about mezcal because that's a whole different, um, it's very different. And there's a lot of things going on with the, uh, the mezcal agaves right now. And basically they're being farmed, huge plantations of, and I'm sure you've probably heard about it or seen it, is mezcal agaves. And, and then they're being harvested before they have their stocks. And that's causing a problem for the bats, and it's causing lots of other issues. Um, Gary Navon has a, a really good book out about about it um, that just came out this year. And if you're interested, you should read it because it's kind of startling. But poke is a, has been used for thousands of years. It's a, a fermented sap. Um, from the agave plant. And I didn't know this is how they gathered it, but there's on the left a historic photo of someone gathering pulque. And look at the size of that about it. It's just astonishing. Um, and then on the right is a more modern day. It's it's from Mexico. The man's from Mexico, but he's gathering the agave staff. And it comes right out of the heart of the agave. And there it is. And it, it, it says in my research that it's not, it has very low alcohol content. It's mostly used in, or it has been used historically in celebration. Um, you know, you think of ways that we celebrate things today, like back where I grew up in Ohio, there was the maple syrup festival and there was the pumpkin festival and apple cider festival. <laughs> there were all these festivals where we celebrated food and things that, you know, during the harvest. And so um, it didn't have the same purpose. Um, this is more honoring the plant and the way the plant is given to the people to use. Yes. Rebecca, you yes. realize that that 50% alcohol and the bulk it means that it you can store it for quite a while without it becoming dangerous. Okay, I didn't I didn't I mean, in the Middle Ages, lots of people would put some sort of wine with water to kill the bad stuff. Oh water. Right. Like, like, yeah. Yeah. And it's because of the alcohol. I didn't know that. Thank you. <clears throat> this is good. Good tip. good thing to know. All right, now Scott, we're moving into yuccas. <laughs> So we have the different names, so if we daddle a mole, a more, a more, I can't even read it, um, Spanish bayonet. Okay, so these were taken in my yard and this spring. However, I didn't get very many bananas this year. We have had a lot of bananas from Yucca Bacata, but not this year. So think about that. What if you are depending on certain plants for your food and they don't produce. What do you do? Where do you go? You might have to travel a long way to find them, to find what you need. Okay, the narrow leaf yucca. Um, this is commonly found throughout our area. Really um, very common, very prevalent, and today even used for making baskets and pot rests sandals, and other useful household items. Um, I just recently learned from Chris Lewis, who's a basket maker from Zuni, that he takes the center rib out um, from the plant to make the leaves more pliable, easy to use. And he said that's how you can tell the age of a, a basket or who made it. 
if this one's red this one. Okay, so these are more narrowly different. But they're in blue. Um, just some more. Mm -hmm. Now, Harriman, we have those growing up. In fact, I think that this photo is from my backyard. I just think they're so pretty with the white margin. And what it didn't even matter if you asked people, like, what what kind of yucca are you using? Do you have a preference for a yucca when you're making a basket or when you're using it for some um, to create some things? And they they say no, whatever's available. We do have a preference, but if we can't find it, we use something else. So it's like they were interchangeable, at least for some people. There's the yucca colada. I don't know what the other one is, but she picked her up. Shawty I just love yucca. So this is the basket maker culture. The people had a very special relationship with the plants surrounding them. These are some of the things that have been found um, that are obviously made from yucca. Um, <clears throat> useful articles for daily life that starting are, you know, are observed starting from about 6,000 years ago during the archaic time. Um, yucca provided food. The roots, blossoms, and fruit were all edible. The fibers were fashioned into twine, woven um, together with rabbit fur or feathers to create blankets. Whole yucca leaves could be made into sandals, sleeping mats, baskets, carrying bags, aprons, cradle boards, and many other household items. So, just about anything you can think of, Yucca could help you with. This is, I used to be a curator at Edge of the Cedars Museum in Blanding. I don't know if any of you have been there, but um, if you haven't been there and you head up north, please stop and see Edge of the Cedars. There's fabulous um, artifacts there. This is a turkey feather blanket. So I don't know if you remember that little photo that said Tricky Pen Ruin that I showed um, a little bit ago, but that is called Tricky Pen Ruin because turkeys were just there and, you know, shells were found and skeletons and things like that. So turkeys were actually being kept there, but this is a turkey feather one. It's feathers wound around yucca twine in a kind of a lattice um, construction. Oh, thousands and thousands of feathers. Okay, here's what it looks like. You can see those little discs that looks like discs or shells. I always think they look like shells, but they're actually the shaft of the feather. And they're wound around the twine. The reason there's no, here I'm pointing. <laughs> okay, the reason there's no feathers on the picture on the left is because um, the feathers have deteriorated. They they were eaten off by small animals or just dried and, you know, it's deteriorated. But the blanket is 2,000 years old. And here's, here's the, the skeleton, so to see. You can still see some of the shaft on it. It once was covered with feathers. And this is all yucca twine. And I wish I could remember how many miles of twine they had, um, they had, Said we're on there. I don't remember. And there's our friend Mary Wiaki, and she is um, from San, Santa Clara Pueblo, and she's part Comanche. And she was commissioned by the state of New Mexico to create a turkey feather blanket. So there's 17,000 turkey feathers. It's quite a work of art, and you can see her twine right there. I I don't know. I I I used to remember things like that, and I. I'm sorry. I have a steel trap mind. <laughs> <laughs> but these are turkeys, the Miriam Mountain turkey, and these are at Hopu Pueblo many, like, 100 years ago. So they're domestic. They're domestic turkeys. Yep. They were domesticated and kept as pets. Not only that, but the turkeys were often found buried in their own grave in beautiful... Uh, with all kinds of special things with them. Sometimes turquoise, um, crystal mm -hmm. stone. If the turkey had broken its leg, for whatever reason, they set the leg. Now, that didn't happen all the time, but people didn't eat the turkeys. They raised them, not 
pets, but family, and they cared for them um, exquisitely. These were big production? I don't know about that. We, there have been shells found. But I, I, I'm sure they were being raised because, like Turkey Crown Ruin, you can tell that that's what was happening there. And that's not the only location. And the other thing, this is the other one, macaws. Macaws were being kept in, in, in pens off of. Here? No, 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 down in um, Casa oh, Grande, yeah. yeah, Mexico. But the macaws were coming up this way. So if, again, if you're at, if you are at um, Edge of the Cedars Museum, this is like the star artifact <laughs> besides the turkey bit of blanket. This is, they call it a sash. I think it was an apron. And the only thing that comes close is that headpiece that was found in northern Colorado um, that's very similar and with the same head construction and with the same scarlet macaw feather um, added to it. And then on this, there's a squirrel pelt. And if that's Abert squirrel. So that's how it was determined that it was constructed in our area. Because <laughs> oh. the feathers were brown. Um, and it was constructed. Well, they have big trading networks. Lots of trading networks. Yep, you're absolutely right. So, and then here's the turkey pens at Casa Grande. There's a turkey at Bandelier on the rocks. And there's the, the, the girl. This is a Kiva mural. And it's from that Pueblo. That is one of the ancestral Isleta Pueblos east of Albuquerque. And for the life of me, I can't remember the name. And I'm so sorry, but it's there. And it's just so, such a beautiful mural. And there she is holding these beautiful scarlet military macaws. Okay, these bundles of twine were found at archaeological sites. This, I'm just showing you these because you can see how important it was. People spent a lot of time making the basic rudimentary materials to, for other objects, used for other objects. This is an apron, a woman's apron. This is a basket that was made out of yucca. This is a portion of a twill basket. And I brought some twill baskets um, on the table up there that you can look at. The oldest twill baskets have the wood ring. Um, but if you buy a newer basket, often it has a metal ring. So one of those is metal on the table and one is wood. But here's the cool thing. If you go back 2,000 years, 1,600 years, 10 years, the baskets look identical. It's so uncanny. There's nothing changed about it. Some people today put a little more design on it. And some people do them playing. This is a woman from San Juan Pueblo, and she's making the basket, same baskets yep. that you could find today. Same ones people at Hopi are making. Not many people at the Pueblos are making these. Now, there's a Hopi, Doreen is a Hopi woman, and so is Iva. Mm -hmm. And those are more modern baskets. Um, this was somebody constructing a mat out of yucca fibers. Here's that ancestral Puebloan twilled yucca sandal. You can see these were whole leaves. And this one was um, kind of braided um, basket maker foil sandal. And this is basket maker uh, twilled. I mean, here's the thing that they tell you. People had were identified by the footprints that their sandals made. So if you think of today, if you know, if you're following your family or something on a hike, your kids run ahead, you can look down and say, oh, Joey went that way, because I know the track of his shoe. <laughs> but you could do that with the sandals. People say that how they could identify, if they knew who you, if they knew your sandal print, they could identify you. But I think that's just cool. I'm sorry? The holes because the, the, the that's right. They get, and why do you think that hole's there? Because you wear them and they grind down on the pants. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean the 
sandals wore out rapidly. Look at the holes on them. You would expect to see holes. These are very soft, finely made sandals. And these are um, actually, the ones with the whole leaves are younger than these. These finely made ones are, are pretty old. They go back to early basketball. And look how beautiful they are. I can't even imagine. I think it's just incredible. Sometimes people say they were probably for ceremony, but there they are with the whole thing because they got worn down. Okay, and here's uh, we're over here for yucca for food. There's the bananas. I brought some. I'm sure you've all seen them. They can be roast, split open and roasted. Um, scoop out the seeds and you can cook it and you've got some applesauce or Something that would be like a sweet potato. Some people say it's bitter. Some people say it doesn't taste like much. And other people say it's very sweet. So I'm guessing it has a lot to do with the time of year. Um, maybe how much rain there's been. Um, it's probably just environmental um, conditions might affect how they speak. And there's the, these are the yucca guaca and the more narrow leaf. Um, yeah. Now, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. That's absolutely right. Everything about the yak is edible. You may not like all the things, but, <laughs> but it's you can eat it <laughs> pretty much like everything. No, no. Oh, the yucca blossom actually, yeah. Some of the restaurants, really nice restaurants, will serve yucca blossom. So, for Navajo people, the yucca is really, especially the narrow leaf, is very important in ceremony. I brought some soap. It's in that little pocket bowl. It doesn't look like anything but shredded up root. But when you mix it with water, it actually becomes like a slippery, sudsy kind of um, substance. And this is used for washing hair during ceremony. Um, and it's the saponin in it that that lends itself to that soapy cleansing. Um, but it's very important in the ceremony. And it still is today, um, especially like if you go to a funeral, you're always supposed to wash it with the yucca soap, um, yucca root soap before you leave the ceremony. So these are some of the things that were, the yucca was used for. The plant juice was used to make pigments. The cords were made, um, cords made with fibers to tie hoops, arrows, and hair sticks. Yucca root soap used during the nightly chant. Yucca leaves were used as counters in the moccasin game. I don't know if you've ever played the moccasin game, but the counters are yucca leaves um, given to women in childbirth and also used to clean sheep wool. Now we're talking about bear grass. So the bear grass is used in the basket construction. Some of the baskets I brought. Um, have the bear grass core. And these are the beautiful flowers. And they, they can be eaten too. <laughs> okay, so here we are with the bear grass. Melina um, have the, that was used just reconfirming the basket platters, um, the split leaf construction of. Um, some of the materials, especially used by the Tohono Awesome. This is what it looks like. So all those coils that are visible, that look like bundles, those are that's all bear grass. So it's shredded, just like the yucca. And then those are yucca um, patterns, so it's patterned over top. And you can tell, if you've ever wondered how you know what a, where a basket came from, you can always tell the Tohono Awesome because of that four um, kind of a square knot in the center. These are Tohono Autumn baskets too, with bare grass coils. Now you can't see them on the left and the right basket, 
those coils are completely covered with yucca, so you can't tell. And then the black is delta from black, if you know what that what that is. Um, and there are people making the beautiful baskets, and you can see the lady with um, holding the basket on the right. Those are the it's kind of a blurry close-up of the bear grass, and then the bear grass extending from um, the basket that the lady on the left is making. Um, it's, it's called Devil's Claw, and I can't think of the Latin name. What is it? I knew it was something. Very good. So Rob knows the name of all the <laughs> He's very, it's very helpful. All of you are very helpful. I appreciate all the information. Okay, so that's what it is. Okay, so here we are. It's another celebration. This is the girls and the women doing, um, celebrating the basket and the plants and honoring the four directions of their food, the harvest with the basket dance. And they're still making the baskets and still doing the dance today. And it goes back hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. of years. So now we're moving on to the sotol. Some of the baskets I brought are made with the sotol, especially that Tarahumara basket um, is made with the sotol. And if you look at it, just be careful because the sotol leaves look like <laughs> saw blades. Very, they're very um, unfriendly to handle. Okay, so it's the heart of the sotol were also eaten, um, much like the agave, but they weren't as large, usually much smaller. Um, so the leaves and fibers were used the same way for baskets, mats, hats, stocks were used for tools and utensils. So pretty much we're seeing a repetition um, for the uses for most of these. Plant. There, the fruits are eaten, um, flowers are eaten, roots are eaten in some way. The stalks are building materials or construction materials. The leaves are used for weaving um, household items. And there's, you can see the sawtooth edges on that. They're really beautiful plants. And then. And if you think back to the beginning and the, the three most, there were four, but we're not counting the Kenyan juniper. So the three most important plants that were given to the people, Wallapai people by elder, elder brother or younger brother were the agave, the yucca, and the prickly pear. So now we're moving into prickly pear, the apuntias. So pretty much we got the same thing going on, almost everything about the prickly pear is useful and can be consumed or used for something. Excellent. Technically, those aren't leaves, they're, they're stems. You're right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just... I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. So, and they're found everywhere, which is also very lovely. <laughs> um, so, just a few of the plants um, that are often used. Um, there's many because they they um, hybridize among themselves. They move. Um, and this is just to reaffirm that um, they're, they have incredible properties. Some people will refer to the prickly pear as superfood because the antioxidants are, are very concentrated in the fruit. Um, because they have anti-inflammatory properties, um, is there, they're really being explored for uh, use in controlling sugar levels in people with diabetes. Um, and I've heard of people reversing diabetes with a diet that includes prickly pear. Um, so it's also used as uh, medicine. So wonderful plant. It says they can usually be found in abundance. However, some years there's nothing. Again, what do you do when you go to look for 
Virginia nuts or cactus fruit or the, the resources that you're counting on and you have to look farther or trade. <laughs> trade with someone who has them. So in this location, um, there were lots of flowers, so lots of fruit. Okay, so this is some of the ways that people use the plant. It was a fresh, moist food supply. They could dry the flowers, pads, and roots for storage and eating during the winter. They have medicinal properties. There's nutritional and health benefits. Oftentimes, uh, if you could find the plants for the cochineal, um, the little scale bug, um, you could, you were able to extract the carmine dye, and you, that was used in textiles. Something I didn't really know, but the needles were used as tattoo needles, especially out in the Mojave uh, area or on the other side of the Colorado River, out by Yuma. Some of the, tri the tribes there did a lot of tattooing, and they they sell juice. And um, the juice, because it's mucilaginous, added to adobe plastering compound. So there's so much that can be done with this. And think of the how do you even know these things? Well, the it's trial and error, and all this information is passed along. And who was I talking to? Someone said, so well, how do you know that? And, and they said, because it works. That's how we know. So here it is, the superfood. Um, and the, the red ones are really high in the anthocyanin, as we know, the red fruit contain that. And then um, the, the yellow and orange ones are the carot carotenoids. I brought some choya buds. Um, those are eaten. They're high in calcium. Um, they, they, they're supposed to have a lot of nutrition. Um, and it's a mainstay for the Tohono O'odham. They really depend on these. And they're available before the saguaro fruit. Because when you think of it, I mean, think of this, okay? Like, I don't can. I do freeze some things. But my garden doesn't supply our family for a whole year. What are you going to do so that you have food for the whole year? Well, you have to find ways of, of um, saving it. Um, or you go around and you make your seasonal rounds to where you can um, collect and gather things. So it has an astringent. The pads or stems have an astringent property. Um, you can take the pads and heal them, um, put the raw flesh over a wound and manage it. And I know this has happened with people have used these. Um, and so there's a story, it's a local history about a bluff Utah pioneer, a Mr. Lyman. He had an infected gunshot wound and he was traveling, like walking across the desert there near Bluff. And he was found by a Paiute man. I guess he collapsed. And the Paiute man treated the infection caused by the gunshot wound by applying a split prickly care pad over the wound and then carried the guy to his house on the horse and took care of them until he recovered. So those that's a real real story about about how prickly pears can help you heal. Okay, so on the shelf of the desert groceries, the prickly pears provide antiseptic and antimicrobial properties and act as an astringent. They can stem blood flow. The tunas are low in fat and calories. And they say low protein too, but they contain a lot of vitamin C, magnesium, potassium, calcium, antioxidants, and fiber. So it's kind of like a multivitamin, right? You don't have to go buy your one a day. <laughs> you can just eat all this good stuff. The natural pectin helps maintain healthy cholesterol levels. It helps control glycemic levels. And the pads contain calcium, vitamin A, protein, and a full range of amino acids. Again, this, they were using the spines for tattoo and the scale for pegging dye and plastering component for adobe walls. I think it was also used as a binder in, in paints and dyes. And there are people who have a kinship with the prickly pear and the plants that nourish and sustain the health of their communities. 
What do they do with the beloved? Those, those tiny little those thorns? Burn them off. Most, mostly burn them off. Ah. Yeah. In hot, hot rock or, you know, like holes. Holes on the like fire on the stone. <laughs> They're highly flammable, yeah. They can be. A lighter works. A lighter? Oh, thank you. I've never thought of it. Like a big lighter. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't know the rural southern that can be there in Mexico. Yes, that is. They're not as tiny as they are here. Well, the, those are probably the Nopals. And, or the... Um, the that's it. Like a syndicate. Because those were brought from Mexico. Yeah. Yes, uh, Native Americans that you refer to also eat lots of grubs and insects and things like that too? Well, I think whatever opportunistic, you know, people are opportunistic yeah. and if that's what you have. I know the Paiute people did, uh, some of the groups that Paiute. Yeah, no, because, you know, I, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I, I feel like I'm, I'm blessed that you guys are even still here. <laughs> and that you're still interested. <laughs> Because I can really talk about these things forever. Okay, so it's not just people having a kinship with the plants, it's other plants. So they depend on one another. These, these um, Echinocereus, I think they were out at Toro Weeks actually, and they're, they need their afternoon shade when they're smaller. So these older yucca plants were kind of giving them a little bit of shade. And then of course, if they flower well, the people can gather the fruit. And then this time of year, this one, I think is in my yard <laughs> where it was, yeah. Okay, and so the seeds are very nutritious. Um, the seeds contain fat and sugar uh, are in the pods. And of course the pods are, the fruit, I call them pods, the, the fruit actually is mostly seed. So you're not gonna get a whole lot of juiciness out of it, but if you gather enough of them, they're, it's worthwhile. Then they grind them down. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, that reminds me. Um, at the edge of the cedars, the seeds that people were gathering, it's just incredible. There was a basket found. I don't know if it's still on display. It was full of, um, you know, rice grass seeds? You know how tiny they are? Rice grass? <laughs> basket full of rice grass seeds. Really? What do you think new people were doing with it? Eating. Eating it. They made they ground it up, they made them like a cereal, you know, cooked it like a mush, but you would add these kinds of seeds to it also. Cactus. So these were used um, throughout the Sonoran and Mojave Desert. Um, this is really <clears throat> interesting. People would take these. I, I don't know if you've ever seen the Tohono on them, they had the, and I'm sure other people do it too, but they'll cut up their squash like like in circles. You clean it out and you're left with like a looks like a pot. <laughs> but it's a it's the out the exterior of the squash. And you can use the seeds then and, and roast them um, and then cut up the rind with a little bit of the meat with it, whatever's left, and string it on a line. Um, and cover it with some kind of a screen um, and let it dry for a couple of days. They would do that with these cactus too. So the cactus would be cut, sliced open um, crossways and then dried. Of course, you have to take the fine off first. And then you can, right? I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you all know that one. But anyway, and then you could um, boil them or roast them during the winter. And here's what they said. It gave a good sense of um, security. It's like if you can and you want to have, well, um, you want to have your store of, of food for the winter. It makes you feel like you got everything you need and you can rest at ease. <laughs> so if you have enough food, uh, you're you're set. And that's how people felt when they collected cactus and saved them. And then these are I brought well you all know what the seeds look like, but I brought them anyway. But these could these were also prepared the same way. The seeds were mixed 
sometimes with rice grass seeds or some other kind of meal. Um, so it's like a gruel. Um, the barrel was skinned, sliced, diced, boiled, roasted. And it could also be cut out, open in a shell, used as a cooking chop. Because, you know, they get pretty big. Some of them. And then I know this isn't in the four corners, but I had to include a little bit of Solaro. So this is um, such a an important plant for the Pahana Awesome people and the river, the river Gila and all the people living um, in the southern part of the country. Very, very important staple, the fruit, um, and they had the celebration with the fruit and the drink, and um, it's still going on today. This, and then, then we have another story for another time. <laughs> We're not going into it today, but there was a request for a program about Bill. So <laughs> we, will, we will someday do a program. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> of course. Of course. Everything. Right? And I wanted to end with um, this is um, Diana Sue and Expressing that we used everything to live. The trees, the sap, the ground, the rocks, the animals were all. So, I'm sorry? Did you get a Thank you. 
right? And there's a, a mid rim. And once that cracks, you can keep keep it wet and just keep beating it. It'll separate, separate, separate. Well, you yeah. actually start to get the stringy fibers between the. It does. And the, just like this. You don't work with tools. So, so this, and then you can see there's a very sharp needle on the end. So if you wanted, you could keep the needle and just keep the needle and just take a few of these. And to get rid of the rest, and you could use it for. Is that all with one leaf? Yeah. One leaf. Okay. One leaf. Quite a bit added. If you keep at it, you'll get something that looks like blonde hair. <laughs> you just have to keep going. And then um, this is, shows the, how you would go about the construction of a, a rabbit fur blanket. So it's wrapping the fur into the cord as you go. As you put it together, um, then this is a this is a pot rest. Um, my friend who's she's part of Hopi and she makes pottery and baskets, and she makes these little pot rests out of yucca. This is the narrow leaf. She leaves the southern rib in first. Um, she probably wasn't taught to teach it out. And then this is just a replica of a sandal. A crude sandal, not one of the fine sandals. Um, this is the yeah, uh, agave, agave bag. This is, a, of course, very new. <laughs> but people that are. That was a microphone. Yeah. yeah. And then this is a very practical thing, a little scrubby. This is also made out of the echo fiber. Um, let's see. These are. Oh, you know the prickly pear fruits, but this is the basket that's made out of the soap rug. Also, this one. Toya bud. These are the, this is the pine needle tarot marrow basket with full of um, the barrel cactus seeds. This is the, what's left of my soap. Now, you can take this and put it in a little bag, like a, a mesh bag or a, one of those little white linen bags and save it and you can use it over and over too but it's it really is nice it's a slippery kind of so slimy at first but then as it gets heavy it really it feels like it's clean it feels like you can wash with it um this is a hopi basket this is yucca with um the um you can see what the air grass is in it also the black one's still the double yes it is um, well, um, this one, I, I don't think this devil is called. It's healthy. So this is a dye. It's a, it might have a charcoal in it. To make it you know, but people trade things. We have friends that grow materials. Like at, at our house, I grow devil spots for the weavers. I also grow sumac. Um, and then we have friends in Grace, Utah that grow sumac for the weavers, too. Yes. Um, I have a couple uh, questions. Yeah. So you were showing that yucca fibers reminded me that there's an edible grass uh, we call mini rice grass. Yeah. yeah. And I'm wondering if you know anything about that. Yeah. Right in my yard. I plant it. Um, yeah. So Do you harvest it? Do you harvest it? Everything? No. <laughs> 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 I'm fine. If I retire. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I will. Well, the other thing I was wondering is how about the other grains? This is prickly pear. It was oh, oh, okay. It was supposed to go with that. All right. Cooking. Well, anyways, my question that is, you're welcome to have. Um, did any of the Native Americans raise any types of bees or honey? I know the America honey bees are from America, so I know that they probably didn't. Well, do there's that. plenty of native bees. I was wondering if they. But um, I don't have any information. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, again, it would be an opportunistic thing if someone found a supply of something. Yeah. Good, they certainly would. But they didn't actively cultivate them. Nobody's ever yeah. told me anything. Most of the uh, ladies we've gotten that you, they, they're yeah. not, they'll drink the nectar themselves, but they use the pollen and the oil to the flowers and don't make honey. I mean, so one of the things they uh, and they they're they're solitary bees, so they don't um, they don't have a place where they live. They don't have a hive. They have a little too they have a sunflower stalk or something hollow to to lay their eggs. So, yeah. 
and their, keep their larva, larva going. These are the yucca baskets um, with the narrow leaf yucca, the sifter basket. So this is a very old one. You can see the edges of it there. Um, look like the one in the photo. Um, it's also neat, just different. It has a wooden rod. And then this has the metal rod. This is a new one. Today, people are really going to extremes and putting a lot of fancy designs on, which is nice. Um, I guess that's about it. I mean, there's, oh, this is six plus. People were making, I just brought this up, cradle, to remind myself to tell you that cradle boards were made out of yucca too. So, I mean, everything was made out of these plants. Well, what is that? It's just a little replica of a hokey cradle board. Oh, it's not, it's not a project that's useful? Cradle board. Yeah, but it would be a big one. You'd have to have a, a size of a, of a baby. But I see, okay, people, that's just symbolic. It is. Yeah. And that, 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 I mean, everything was made out of, well, yeah, everything was made out of these trees. And it, so I brought this, I guess some of you I told already. Where I work, we, we make um, materials for the youth and not level people. And so, this is one of the posters that have the plants on how the Navajo people use, use plants. And so a few of them, two of them, I think, are the yucca in the prickly pear on here. But it's, 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 it's so, it goes beyond just the plant. It's, again, the relationship. And so this, I just brought these in case you were interested. It has some of the uses on that the Navajo people. Um, what they use the plants for dyes and, and things that they eat and the rice grass is on here and um the what, what about cottonwood? cottonwood? Um cottonwood um is mostly a building material. But cottonwood right. cottonwood fluff um was used as like a diaper stuff they put in a third oh. <laughs> 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 diapers. Diapers oh. with and juniper bark, shredded juniper bark and things like that. But I don't, I mean, we're not, we're talking about cactus, so I was trying to stick with program. <laughs> <laughs> and then these, you're welcome to a bookmark if you like, because this is respect, plants, and animals speak to them in the Navazad, which is from Navajo language. So, and then the names are on the back. But if you're interested, you're welcome to take them. There's mesquite cookies. I made those so, last night. Tell about um, the mesquite cookie. What's that? Does the flower just mesquite beans? It's, Eat beans, so it's ground up to be a meal, to be a fine meal. It's, it's mixed with almond flour and a little bit of whole wheat flour. There's a little bit of sugar. There is an egg. There's plunger. So it's like not not um, an authentic old recipe for on a Saudi day. No, no. <laughs> but substitute. Well, just to know. Just we look at these resources and we just walk on by. I know. And we just walk down the grocery store and we ignore all this That's stuff. Right. Well, yeah, maybe we, we don't actually ignore it, we just educate it. Right. And the, here's That's the other it. thing that you have to think about communities a thousand years ago, just say it's a round number. They have ways of interacting with their environment that sustain the population of plants. They, if you want to go out and pick something or even gather seeds, you have to have a permit. <laughs> I mean, you can't just go to the. When I worked for the Forest Service, if any of the public people wanted to come gather plants, we had to issue them a permit. Now, that really wouldn't get. I feel <laughs> but so, but it had to those rules had to be respected because there's so many of us today and there's so many people that the, the resources would be decimated and we don't have cities that everything takes up so much space right. and you know how things are endangered certain plants and and, and and environment so we are living in a different time. We all just can't go out and take what's there. Um, but we can grow it. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah. 